Just after midnight on September 19, 1911, a quarry worker on Kelly's Island, Ohio, snuck into a potato patch to swipe a few end-of-season potatoes for himself and his roommates in the house they shared. As he bent over to grab the goods, a knife was plunged into his back by a man in the dark of night. When the man's brother came out to look for him an hour later, the brother was shot and killed. Neither man had any idea that a killer was lurking in the dead of night, nor did they see him. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. Kelly's Island is located in the Ohio waters of Lake Erie. When the British still controlled Lake Erie, they called it Sandusky Island. Later on, when the United States took possession of the island from the British, they gave it a new name, calling it Island Number 6. And nobody ever said the federal government was terribly creative, did they? It was later named Cunningham Island and was ultimately renamed Kelly's Island in 1840 by brothers Datis and Irad Kelly, who had purchased nearly the entire island. Kelly's Island is a very popular vacation destination, and it's visited by hundreds of thousands of people each summer. While its year-round population is only about 300, its summer population reaches over 5,000 at any given time. People are drawn to the island's sandy beaches, a large state park with campground, nature preserves, restaurants, wineries, a marina, unique geologic formations, and many other tourist attractions. Several ferries provide regular transportation to and from the mainland throughout most of the year until Lake Erie generally freezes around January. But a small airfield for private planes also serves the island. The Kelly's Island ferry boat line is the primary ferry to the island and is the only ferry carrying vehicles, but the Jet Express ferry line also serves the island. It's the largest of the American Lake Erie Islands and is the second largest island overall in Lake Erie. Only Pelee Island to the north, in Canada, is larger. Kelly's Island is only three and a half miles or about 5.6 kilometers south of the Canadian border, which runs through the middle of Lake Erie. Speaking of the Canadian border, One interesting tidbit about Ohio is that it has a longer international border than California. In much earlier times, Kelly's Island was occupied by Native Americans of the area. In fact, the most well-known petroglyph in the state of Ohio is Inscription Rock on the south shore of the island. This large limestone boulder was likely carved in late prehistoric times by the Sandusky culture, well before the Iroquois arrived. During the beginning of the War of 1812, the island was used as a military rendezvous post, first by the British Navy and later by the U.S. Navy. During the early 19th century, the island was mostly uninhabited. Later in the 19th century, however, several limestone quarries operated on the island. And while the island is home to one winery today, it historically was home to a large number of wineries. The Kelly's Island Wine Company, a co-op of the island's wineries, was formed in 1865 and produced over 350,000 gallons of wine per year. Back to the story. The two men that were murdered in the potato patch were brothers named Jan and Petri Beryl, immigrants from Italy who temporarily lived on the island while working for the Kelly's Island Lime and Transport Company which was one of those quarries on the north side of the island. The two brothers shared the house with three other Italian immigrants who also worked in the quarry. These men were Rocco Klewicz, Dominic Salvaggio, and Antonio Descari. Jan and Petri Basil had saved up $600, equivalent to about $17,500 today, working in the quarry. 
They planned to bring this money back with them to their native Italy. The murders of the Barrel brothers were not random. They were actually planned out well in advance. It all began about a month earlier, in August 1911. Jan and Petri had been saving their money up, but being immigrants, they didn't have an in-depth knowledge of American money denominations. Their roommate, Rocco Claywich, was much better with American money, so he helped the brothers count their cash. This gave Claywich knowledge of not only how much money they had, which was a lot, but also where they kept it hidden. It wasn't long before Claywich told the other two roommates about all the money, and the three immediately went into action, plotting a way to get their hands on it. They decided they'd have to murder the two brothers to separate them from their money. The house the five quarry workers lived in was part of a small company town, an area with a dense cluster of rental homes. So the first order of business was to lure the men to a quieter, more secluded part of the island. This wasn't hard to find, as even today, Kelly's Island has plenty of such places. The way they enacted this part of the plan was simple. Silvaggio barked an order at Jan Barrel. He told him to go swipe some potatoes from a nearby patch one night. Apparently, Silvaggio was the kind of guy that people tended to listen to when he barked orders, and Jan slipped on some shoes and went straight out to the field to carry out the task. It was the middle of the night when Jan followed a trail out to the dark potato patch. As he did, Silvaggio stalked him from a distance. When he got to the patch, Jan knelt down to grab a few plump potatoes off the ground, and Silvaggio sprung out from behind some brush. He quickly lunged at Jan with his knife, killing him so swiftly that he probably never saw it coming. Afterwards, Silvaggio walked back down that path to the boarding house. He began to get anxious. What if someone heard the scuffle? The pace of his walk began to pick up until he was nearly running when he got into the house. As he threw the door open, he shouted that Jan had been shot by the owner of the potato patch and needed immediate assistance. Petri was horrified by the news and began to sob uncontrollably. Silvaggio, playing the role of the good friend, told Petri that all four of the housemates would head out to the patch together to tend to Jan. So the four men hurried out of the house and headed down that path. As they approached the body, the three roommates held back a bit and let Petri arrive first to lend assistance to his brother. As Petri bent down to tend to his brother, Silvaggio pulled a gun from his pocket and fired it, although he didn't get the reaction he expected. Instead, Petri turned around, confused by the loud noise. Silvaggio completely missed his target. At this point, Claywich grabbed the gun from Silvaggio and fired at Petri, hitting him squarely in the chest and killing him almost instantly. With both brothers now lying dead in the potato patch, the remaining three housemates turned around and hightailed it back to the boarding house. Once there, they had to figure out what to do next. What Silvaggio and Claywich didn't expect was that the third remaining roommate, Antonio Descari, started to develop some trepidation over what had taken place. Maybe it was a fear of returning to prison, or perhaps it was just a momentary bout of guilt. Either way, it came as a surprise to the other two, as Descari arrived at the island with a significant track record of violent crimes. He served a two-year stint in a New York State prison for his role in the Black Hand Society, a violent criminal gang linked to extortion, kidnapping, assault, and even murder. The notion of the violent criminal suddenly turning soft was of major concern to the other two men. He was now seen as the weakest link among the three. Later that night, while Descari was fast asleep, Silvaggio decided to take action. He grabbed a razor blade and slit Descari's throat. Instead of slipping into a quick and quiet death, though, 
Discari's eyes opened up wide and he jumped up and started fighting Salvaggio. The scuffle moved from the bedroom into the hallway and eventually Discari fell down the steps and was unconscious by the time he hit the bottom of the stairwell. He never woke up. Now, Claywitch and Salvaggio had three bodies to dispose of and only a few hours of darkness in which to do it. This was a work night after all. The plan for the two Barrel Brothers' bodies had always been to tie them to limestone boulders, which were plentiful on the northern part of the island, and drop the bodies and their accompanying boulders into the Lake Erie water on the north side of the island. After the two murderers completed that task, there wasn't much time until sunrise and they couldn't leave the body of their murdered roommate in their house. They tied the body of Descare to another limestone boulder and dragged it into the lake at the beach near their house. This location didn't provide the remoteness that the north shore of the island did. Being a sandy beach, there are naturally more people in the area. But it would have to do as time didn't permit taking the body anywhere else. After they dumped the body in the waters of Lake Erie at the beach, the two men dressed for work and went to the quarry as if nothing happened. Their plan was to conduct business as usual for a few days and then make a quick getaway off the island and ultimately return to their native Italy with the stolen $600. The plan was foolproof, or so they thought. It turns out that Lake Erie is a much more powerful sea than the men believed it to be. About a week after the murders, a naked man's body washed ashore at the beach. When some quarry workers pulled the body to shore, it was obvious from the ropes on the hands and legs and slit mark on the throat that this was a murder victim. News of the murder spread like wildfire across the island. The initial rumor and speculation was that the body was dumped from a ship passing by, which made some sense since no island residents seemed to be missing at first. Plus, the island had very little history of violent crimes of any sort, let alone murder. But when Erie County Sheriff Herman Reuter arrived from Sandusky on the Ohio mainland, he immediately caught a different vibe, particularly because he saw a trail of blood on the beach. The following day, the body was identified as Antonio Descari. A similar trail of blood was found leading from his boarding house to the beach. It wasn't exactly going to take Humphrey Goodman or Jake Doyle to crack this case. Not long after the trail of blood from the boarding house was discovered, it also became apparent that the other four resident Italian quarry workers were missing. Sheriff Reuter crossed the water to Marblehead and asked around at the Marblehead Danbury train station to see if any of the four men had been there. He quickly learned that at least two Italian men had booked train tickets right after news of the murder came out. The men had also sent a large trunk, which was their luggage, ahead to Cleveland by rail. So the sheriff headed to Cleveland along with a foreman from the quarry so the men could be identified. I mean, they didn't have pictures after all. They had no luck spotting them in Cleveland, but found that the trunk had been sent ahead to Pittsburgh so the sheriff and four men also sent themselves to Pittsburgh. When they got to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, local authorities there were eager to help with the case, and knowing that the men were Italian, they focused on areas of the city that had large Italian immigrant populations, including Oakland, East Liberty, the Lower Hill District, and Bloomfield, which is sometimes referred to as Little Italy, and incidentally, is where my dad grew up. While local detectives were helping Sheriff Reuter search for the two suspects in Pittsburgh, two more bodies were discovered by a fisherman on the north shore of Kelly's Island. The two bodies were identified as the Barrel Brothers, and it was quickly apparent that the island now had a triple murder, the first and only triple murder in its history. On September 30th, 1911, 11 days after the first murders, police from Pittsburgh and Sandusky raided a boarding house in the East Liberty neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A surprised clay witch and Salvaggio tried to make a run for it out the back door of the house, but quickly realized it was a futile effort. They were caught. 
The pair were booked at a jail in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they both requested to be extradited to Italy. They were extradited, but to Sandusky, Ohio, not Italy. Only a month later, murder trials would begin for both men who were tried separately. The first to go on trial was Rocco Claywich, who pled not guilty and used the assistance of a court-appointed interpreter through the trial. Claywich was found guilty and could have been sentenced to death by an electric chair. Instead, the jury recommended life in prison as one of the jurors felt that the death sentence was not appropriate in this case. Against his attorney's advice, however, Claywich submitted an appeal for a new trial based on a number of reasons. In the second trial, which began in June 1912, he for some reason pled guilty to murdering Patry Barrel. His strategy appeared to be to come across as a truthful and honest person who just got mixed up on a bad situation. But the jury didn't buy it, finding him guilty and recommending a death sentence. Next up was Dominic Salvaggio. His case only resulted in one trial where he pled not guilty. He claimed to have no idea how all that blood got there, and it was only a coincidence that he left the island at the time of the murder. The jury didn't buy his story either, finding Salvaggio guilty and recommending the death sentence for him as well. Both men were found guilty of, quote, homicide that was committed purposely with deliberate and premeditated malice. On November 14, 1912, Rocco Claywich was executed by electric chair. Eight days later, on November 22, his partner in crime, Dominic Salvaggio, was also executed by electric chair. The only reason we know all the details of the murders is that prior to his electrocution, Claywitch wanted to make peace with God, in his own words. His confession came after the death penalty was handed down, so his confession appeared to be an effort to avoid eternal damnation in the fires of hell. Let's pause here for a quick break, then we'll hear about an entirely different murder saga on Kelly's Island this one being a little bit more recent. On November 5th, 1984, the phone rang at the Kelly's Island Police Station around 7 p.m. When the island police chief, Charles Moore, picked up the phone, he was told by employees at a Cleveland business owned by Thomas Hoyt Jones Jr. that they were very concerned. They couldn't reach their boss, Mr. Jones, who should have returned to his home in the Cleveland, Ohio suburb of Brattonall the previous evening. Brattonall is a small but wealthy enclave situated just east of Cleveland on Lake Erie. It's been home to a number of professional athletes, including Cleveland Cavaliers stars Kevin Love and Tristan Thompson, famous law enforcement man Elliot Ness, actress Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch of the West in Wizard of Oz, and actor Jim Backus, better known, of course, as Thurston Howell III on the sitcom Gilligan's Island. According to his employees, Thomas Hoyt Jones had spent the weekend closing up his cottage on Kelly's Island for the winter, but should have returned to work that Monday. He didn't show up and hadn't contacted anyone, which was highly out of character for him. Police Chief Moore was familiar with the Jones family. Thomas Hoyt Jones Sr., The father of the allegedly missing man had acquired about 60 acres of land on the northeast point of Kelly's Island in 1940, and the family had been regular visitors to the island through the years. Recently, the family had donated about 21 acres of the family's land on the island to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History to be used as a research nature preserve. The Joneses were a very prominent family in the Cleveland area. Thomas Jr.'s grandfather, Thomas A. Jones, served on the Ohio Supreme Court. Thomas Sr. was a standout quarterback on the Ohio State University football team, but made a bigger name for himself later when he became senior partner of the newly merged law firm Jones Day, Cockley, and Revis. Today, that law firm has a global footprint 
and is known simply as Jones Day. Thomas Hoyt Jones Sr. had two sons, Brooks and Thomas Jr., who was routinely described in newspapers as a, quote, millionaire Brattonal financier. Thomas Jr. founded a Cleveland-based investment company in the 1940s and an oil company in Calgary, Alberta, in 1950. He also led an investment group that owned and developed large swaths of Canadian land. So, Thomas Hoyt Jones Jr. was a very successful businessman. He married a woman named Hossie Van Dozer in 1954, and they had two children, but were divorced in 1982. Hossie had been a world traveler during the marriage, and even more so after the divorce. She died in Munich, Germany in May 1984, only five months before that frantic phone call to the Kelly's Island Police Department. Ever since the divorce, Thomas Jr. has divided his time between his home in Brattonall and the cottage on Kelly's Island. After receiving the phone call, Chief Moore went to the Jones cottage at about 7.20 p.m. He found Thomas's dog, a golden retriever named Shag, running around the property unattended. Seeing no sign of Thomas, the chief went into the cottage, where he found Thomas Hoyt Jones Jr.'s naked body in the bathroom. He had been strangled. Investigators on Kelly's Island soon learned that Thomas had not been alone in the cottage that weekend. He was accompanied by a young man named Angelo Darnell Vaughn, who worked for Thomas as a handyman, cook, and chauffeur. By this time, Vaughn had left the island. Also missing from the cottage were Thomas's 1983 Dodge Aries station wagon, two televisions, a watch, a gold ring, and two credit cards. Vaughn was last seen leaving the island that morning on the 9 a.m. ferry to Marblehead. He quickly became the chief suspect in Thomas's murder and a warrant was issued for his arrest. Sidebar, did you catch the make of Thomas's vehicle? This multi-millionaire financier drove a Dodge Aries, a K car, for those of you who remember what that was. For those who don't, a K car was a very pragmatic, low-priced vehicle that was super popular in the early to mid-1980s. It was credited with saving the Chrysler Corporation. Thomas's cottage was also fairly modest for someone with the kind of money that the Jones family had. We can only surmise that Thomas led a relatively simple life rather than being caught up in the trappings of wealth. After learning about the warrant for his arrest, Angela Vaughn called Cleveland police on November 11, 1984. He wanted to arrange his surrender. He was arrested inside Thomas's K car at the parking lot for a commuter train in Cleveland. Besides Thomas's car, Vaughn also had his watch, which was easily recognizable since its face bore the initials Thomas H. Jones in the place of the 12 numerals normally found on a watch. Upon questioning, Vaughn, who at the time was supporting a girlfriend and a baby, admitted to police that he had placed Jones in a chokehold and held him there for about 8 to 10 minutes. Later, while on trial, Vaughn claimed that he acted in self-defense, purporting that Thomas had attacked him in the cottage's bedroom. He never claimed to have not killed Thomas, though. In their opening statements... Vaughn's attorneys tried to claim that Vaughn was fighting off a sexually motivated attack. The judge presiding over the trial, James McChrystal, refused to allow defense attorneys to call three witnesses who were going to allege a sexual relationship between the two men. Having abandoned that defense, the lawyers then switched gears and argued that there was a fight between the two men and Vaughn feared for his life killing Thomas in self-defense. However, there were several problems with the self-defense defense. 
For one thing, at the time of his death, Thomas was 70 years old and not in the best of health, while Vaughn was a strapping 19 years old. Vaughn's defense also did not explain the bruising on Thomas's face, the fact that the body was later dragged from one room to another, or the theft of Thomas's vehicle and possessions. After only three and a half hours of deliberation, the jury convicted Vaughn of first-degree murder, although he was only sentenced 15 years to life for the murder, plus two additional years for stealing the car. Angelo Vaughn was incarcerated at the Lima Correctional Facility in Lima, Ohio. He took up a job in the prison's cardboard box factory and by all accounts kept to himself and did his job without causing any trouble. That is, until one afternoon less than a year into his sentence, on a routine 4 p.m. headcount in August 1985, Vaughn was unaccounted for. He was immediately listed as an escapee, and local law enforcement were notified to be on the lookout for him. It turns out Vaughn had never actually left the prison, though. He was found later that night around 11 p.m. in the box factory, where he had buried himself under a large pile of insulation. He planned to hang out there until 2 or 3 in the morning and then try to break out when no one was around. After that incident, Angelo Vaughn was moved to the maximum security prison in Lucasville, Ohio, and ended up being sentenced to serve additional time. Finally, after 20 years in prison, Vaughn was released on parole and was befriended by a man in the Slavic Village neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. Within a week, the man let Vaughn move into his apartment with him. After less than a week living there, Vaughn repaid the man by viciously attacking him with a hammer while he slept. The man woke up after the first blow and pleaded for his life. But Vaughn didn't stop the attack until the man was able to fight him off long enough to call 911. Vaughn stole $400 in cash and the man's car. The man survived the attack, but his injuries left him permanently disabled. The Vaughn was arrested on February 28, 2007, and was later indicted on one count of attempted murder, a first-degree felony, one count of aggravated robbery, a first-degree felony, and one count of felonious assault, a second-degree felony. He was ultimately sentenced to a 40-year prison term for the attack. Angela Vaughn is still in prison today, serving time at the Marion Correctional Institution in Marion, Ohio. He will be eligible for parole in March 2047 when he is 81 years old. A legacy of Thomas Hoyt Jones remains on Kelly's Island today. That land donated by Thomas and his brother to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History is now known as the Jones Preserve, and it serves a vital role as stopover habitat for migratory birds crossing Lake Erie each spring and autumn. It's also an important research reserve for the museum. If you've never been to Kelly's Island, or if it's been a while since you've been there, I highly recommend a trip over. It's a truly special place. And that's all for this episode of Great Lakes True Crime. A big thank you to the show supporters who bought me a virtual cup of coffee through the website at podpage.com slash Great Lakes True Crime. And also, many thanks to those of you who recently left five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and several other podcast apps. Those positive reviews really help us out, and your help does not go unnoticed. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Great Lakes True Crime. You can also check out links in the show notes for our social media handles, web address, and the show merchandise page. This has been Steve, your host and producer. Thanks for listening. Bye. 